here comes the, the insane closed captions from Zoom. Karen Krishnan is a microbiologist. I call him lovingly the microbiomologist, which <laughs> I seriously need to take out as a trademark. Hey, Cindy, I how you doing? It. We can see you. We love you. So Cindy is here to help out. Thank you very much um, with posting some links, et cetera. But Karen okay. has really um, revolutionized the way people understand probiotics. He is the co-founder of Microbiome Labs. He travels around the world. How many days last year, Karen? Oh, well, I, I go by miles. So almost 400,000 miles, which is about maybe at least 70% of the time. So a lot. Okay. So yeah. it's a big sacrifice hmm. because, you know, he has a wonderful family, but he's also on a mission, just like I am, just like Cindy is, and, you know, just like you all are. Hmm. And um, the mission is to be well and healthy and to also crack open the previously and still mysterious connections of the microbiome with the rest of our bodies and health and mood and sleep and skin and to um, up-level it through probiotics and, and enzymes and other technology. I'm gonna tell you, Karen, that the title of this is A User's Guide to Spore-Based Probiotics. Mm. But I know that we have a lot of other things to talk about about what's coming in 2023. Mm. And this is the bottle guys it's they have new labels this is what megaspore looks like you've probably seen it in your practitioner's offices and they have new labels we'll show you they look more like this now mm -hmm. um that sort of theme but the other thing i just wanted to mention was you know when we do these with karen he very graciously gives us a coupon and in december i asked him boldly if we could have a 25 percent off coupon now he's never done that before and he graciously said yes and then i mailed it the information about it basically when everyone sent me an out of office reply so i think a lot of people missed it so i once again boldly went to karen and i said hello happy new year happy new you may we please have that coupon extended so it is going to be going on for a little bit longer thank you of Don't course. tell anyone, by the way, except your inner circle that he did this because he has a lot of friends. Yeah. I'm one of them, but he has a lot of friends that are going to be PO'd that <laughs> I got it and they didn't. So take We're advantage of it. Any, We're not doing any others out there right now. So I, I've yeah. never seen it before. I mean, like, I didn't even think it was going to say yes. And that's not even like a gimmick or anything. So if you have Q and A's, put the, the A's will be from him. Put the Q's in the Q and A box. If you have chat, please just leave the chat to um, tech issues because it's very distracting. With that, let's take it away. Talk to us about spore probiotics, Kieran, and what we can expect in the new year. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, happy new year to everybody that's wow. coming on. And, and thank you as always, Siobhan, for having me on here. Um, and it is also Chinese New Year time. So there's lots of uh, good hope for long lives and, and, and prosperity. That's a... Uh, a big theme in Chinese New Year. I know I grew up in Malaysia and uh, Singapore um, for part of my life and Chinese New Year is huge then. So it's all about prosperity, prosperity, good health, long life. So what a good way to kick it off with really understanding about your microbiome and, and spores and uh, and we'll talk about metabolic health and, and a number of different things. Um, so, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, spore-based probiotics are a different category of probiotics, um, you know, with, without tooting my own horn, I think we kind of created that category. Back in, uh, when we launched in 2013, we were the first all spore consortium product on the marketplace um, in a relatively crowded probiotic space. But we saw this, this opportunity for a, um, an improvement in the therapeutic capability of probiotics by looking at this new category. Um, that existed. And now it's a firm category in the probiotic segment. In fact, if you look at market analysis data and all that, they actually segment out spore-based probiotics as a separate category. Um, so, so it's exciting to see that. It's exciting to see the, the um, relevance of it and the uh, awareness of it increase over time, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So let, let's talk about in general, uh, why, why I think this is such an important category and why, you know, Siobhan has brought on uh, this, this opportunity constantly over the last few years to teach uh, the audience about it. Um, to me, it is actually from an evolutionary standpoint, the foundational probiotic we're supposed to get, right? So keep in mind that the vast majority of microbes that we have inhabiting our system, we get 
within during the birthing process and then the few years after, right? So that's passing through the vaginal canal. Well, in fact, in utero, there is some inoculation as well that's happening of the, the, um, the fetus's gut through mom's gut bacteria that are being brought there by immune cells. So it's really fascinating. So there's some level of inoculation that's occurring in utero. During the birthing process, you're supposed to get a huge inoculum passing through the vaginal canal. Of course, 33, 34% of people don't get to do that because of the C-section rate. Uh, and then close interaction with mom and dad, skin to skin contact and, and uh, very just close environments. And then of course, breastfeeding. Breast milk contains lots and lots of microbes, you know, several hundred species of microbes in breast milk itself. Those then all kind of make up your core biome that exists within your system. Hopefully you got the right level of exposure and not too many things that, that contradict the establishment of those core microbes, things like antibiotics and, you know, too much formula and, uh, you know, exposure to things like Roundup and all that early on can disrupt the establishment of that core biome and create a uh, potential for long-term dysbiosis. Now for the rest of your life, you still have a relationship with bacteria, uh, but it's not coming from the same sources. You're not going to pass through the vaginal canal again, right? You're not mm -hmm. going to be in utero again. You're not going to be breastfeeding again. Where you're going to be is in the outside environment. And the outside environment is full of microbes. So we encounter microbes all the time in our day-to-day -day living. Now, not as much as we should now because of right. our modern sterile environments, but just think about human evolution for the last 99.9% .9 of the time that humans were evolving, we had a very intimate relationship with the outside environment. The outside environment is host to trillions upon trillions of different bacteria. We interact with those microbes all the time, inadvertently eating them as we ate you know, foods that we plucked and foraged for and we hunted for, uh, drinking them through as we drank water out of rivers and streams, uh, all of these different ways in which we got exposed to these microbes as we slept in the dirt, ate dirt, did all of this stuff within the environment. And as it turns out, there's a very important relationship between this osmotic state that we achieve with the microbes in the outside environment and the microbes within to create diversity and balance uh, and a, um, a, a level of uh, resilience in the human microbiome. The resilience is largely dictated by your level of exposure through your life, right? So if you were born and you had all of the exposure of beneficial bacteria during the birthing process, so let's say you were born through the vaginal canal, you had a year of breastfeeding, you had lots of skin to skin contact with mom and dad and so on, right? But then the rest of your life, you lived in a sterile bubble. Your microbiome would actually be very weak, non-resilient, low diversity, and you'd have lots and lots of issues, right? You'd have lots of immune issues, for example. I'll explain why. But if you had even a marginal uh, early inoculum, meaning you were born C-section, maybe you breastfed only for two or three months instead of a year. There's a lot of antimicrobial use and all that. And you started off with a incomplete microbiome or dysfunctional core biome, but then you spent the rest of your life engaging with microbes in the environment in a significant way. Let's say you lived out in the, uh, in, you know, in the farmlands, uh, you know, you were like a natural chicken raiser uh, and you had wild chickens ranging around, right? And you, you weren't in a factory style farm and you foraged a lot and you, you hunted for your own food and so on. You would ha probably have a healthier microbiome overall than the individual that had a good start but lived with low levels of exposure, right? So it, the studies are clear that people who live in um, urban environments, for example, versus rural environments, people who live in the rural environments tend to have much higher diversity in the microbiome and tend to have much higher, uh, healthier outcomes because of the level of exposure that they get to natural microbes. So this was the key thing to us. Uh, for us, it was all about, well, what are the natural microbes that make the biggest difference, right? exposure in general is good. We need as much exposure as we can get. So just going out for hikes and being in the dirt and doing all that stuff is really, really good. But we also wanted to go, we wanted to hone in on it. We want to get very specific because we were thinking probiotics. So what would you put in a probiotic to mimic the most important 
levels of exposure in the outside environment. That's where the spore microbes came from because the spores are uniquely situated to act as a probiotic in the human system, right? And the reason for that is because of that ability to form the spore coating. The spore coating is basically a protein calcified coating that protects this microbe going through the gastric system. 99.9% .9 of microbes you encounter in the outside environment, if you inadvertently swallow them, they will die in the, in the stomach, right? As they should. That's how the system is designed. Now, their debris will move through and stimulate your immune system and create some metabolic responses in your microbiome, which can be beneficial, uh, which can be beneficial on its own, but they won't go in and colonize and do anything in particular by themselves. So we wanted to hone in on the microbes in the environment that would. So then you start to find that there are certain microbes, very, very, very few, that live both in the gut and live in the outside environment at the same time, right? Those are two vastly different conditions. So they are as different as the environment at the bottom of the deepest trench of the ocean, where it's extremely cold, very high pressures, right? No sunlight at all. Sun doesn't, the light from the sun doesn't make its way down there. It's got completely gas, different gas uh, environments, you know, lots of nitrogen, methane, and things that come out of the vents, um, and, and very, very harsh environment. Compare that to the top of Mount Everest, right? Which again, the air is super thin up there. It's again, very cold, but it is an aerobic environment. You know, the, the winds and the, all of those conditions are so different. That's how different the gut is from the outside environment that we walk around in, right? The gut is an anaerobic environment for the most part. Most of your gut has no oxygen in it. It's dark. There's no sunlight. It's always wet. There's no desiccation, right? So it's not dry at any given point. There's always food and drink and things flowing through. There's also very, very high density of microbes in a small given area. Compare that to the outside environment. Take the dirt, for example, which is a dry environment. There's UV radiation from the sun. It's aerobic because it's an oxygen-rich environment, right? There's the density of microbes is less in the dirt than it is in your gut. And so, and, and so the environments are very different. And given that there are some species of microbes that can live in both of those environment, environments, speaks to the fact that these microbes are designed by nature to go from the dirt into the gut, live in the gut for a period of time, and then go back to the dirt and so on. They cycle through the human system. And there's great evidence for all of this. You know, there's lots of studies published on all of this. So I'm giving you the Cliff's Notes version. Yeah. And so when we understood that, we started seeing, okay, the, there are specialized microbes that do this unique life cycle where they go through the human body, they do things in the human body, then they leave through defecation, they remain outside until they're re-swallowed again, and they go through this whole life cycle over and over and over again. And then you start to think about how a modern lifestyle negates that type of exposure, right? We simply don't encounter these microbes the way we should be because we're not eating dirt, we're not living in the outside environment anymore. So that became a fundamental opportunity for therapeutics for us, right? How do we reestablish that cycle? How do we reestablish that exposure? And what microbes do we use to do that? So that's how we really honed in on these bacillus endospores. And we very carefully selected the species of bacillus endospores that were isolated from the human gut, meaning they were well adapted to live in the gut, make their way out if they need to, but then come back in the gut and establish themselves and, and, uh, and, and conduct functions in the gut. And, and so once we identified those organisms, which are the ones that are found in Megaspore, uh, we started to analyze what they actually did in the gut. And that's where it became absolutely fascinating because as it turns out, these microbes are responsible for things in the gut that we can't do ourselves. Right. So as humans, as a species, what we've done is we've outsourced a lot of the maintenance work of the gut to environmental microbes. Right. And, and I'll explain why that is. It's such a unique relationship with these outside microbes. Right. Because in part, we have a very limited genomic set. Right. We have only about 22,000 functional genes 
in the human body. And remember, genes dictate all of the mechanisms that occur in your body. If you don't have a gene for something in your body, you can't create a protein, you can't make, make something happen, right? So if you don't have a blueprint for it, it's not going to happen as a response in your body. We only have 22,000 genes. If you're not familiar with genetics, that may sound like a lot, but keep in mind that an earthworm has about the same number of genes, right? So we're not that cool or sophisticated when it comes to our genomic library, which means that what we've done is we've outsourced a lot of the functions we need to microbes that we live with that live within us, that we live around and live within uh, their environment as well. So there's, we've developed this beautiful symbiotic relationship with these microbes. So the spores, as it turns out, what they are able to do when we swallow them, we have developed a relationship where our immune system tolerates them. Our immune system sees them as self and non-harmful, mm -hmm. right? So the immune system doesn't initiate a big reaction when we swallow them and they come into the system. So we give them a home. In exchange, what we ask of them is to clean up the home for us, right? So they do a few really cool things in the home. First of all, they do quorum sensing, where they read the microbial environment that, they're, that they enter into, which is our gut. They can actually detect, find and detect pathogenic organisms, go sit next to them and eliminate those pathogenic organisms without damaging anything else around, right? We've published uh, a few studies on this. The, the most profound ones that to me are super exciting are two studies that we published with Cleveland Clinic on one of the most difficult pathogens to deal with in the gut, C. diff, right? Clostridium difficile. Right. If anyone's had C. diff, you know that, you know, if, if you had C. diff and you went into the hospital with really bad bloody stools, they probably put you on, on a barrage of, of antibiotics, including vancomycin and so on. Once the bloody stools stopped and seemed to be under control, you probably still had GI symptomology, but then they would send you back home. Uh, to finish out your course of antibiotics and somewhere around 35, 40% of people get reinfections relatively quickly and you have to come back in, right? And then many people have to live with C. diff for the rest of their lives, right? Mm -hmm. And having continuous bouts of it. It's a very difficult pathogen or opportunist to get rid of. So we did the study where we said, okay, let's see if our spores can have the capability of going in, finding C. diff and, and actually reducing its levels. Um, and this was done in a, in a well-accepted uh, model, animal model for Clostridium difficile that has been published before by Cleveland Clinic. And keep in mind, Cleveland Clinic is one of the top integrated medicine research institutes there is. So what they were able to show in this publication, uh, which is out there for those who want to read, is that... The, the spores in Megaspore, the exact same formula, once uh, given to a C. diff infected mouse, what, the, what they do is they actually go into the gut, they seek out the clostridium, and then they surround the clostridium. And, not, and, and in this case, they don't produce antimicrobials to try to reduce the, the level of the clostridia. They actually produce a chelating agent that starves the, cl the clostridia of iron and other minerals. So they literally have found a mechanism to beat this relatively robust competitor, wow. right? And antimicrobial wouldn't work because the clostridium can also form a spore. So it can protect itself if it needs to. So this, our spores have found a way to starve it by stealing minerals away from it, right? Which is absolutely wow. mind-blowing, right? You can't, you can't engineer that. That's, that's just nature at its best, right? That's millions of years of coevolution at its best. And then basically it brings down dramatically the level of clostridia in that environment. And it does so without harming or touching anything else. It's so specific to just that clostridia. So that's just an example of the kind, kind of maintenance. Many that, things. Right? Yeah, yeah, one of the many things that these microbes do for us. And we've outsourced that functionality because you have to you have to think how in the world does this microbe do these spores know of, of the trillions of bacteria that are in your gut how do they know it's a clostridia that's bad right and go after it and there's tons of examples of this kind of thing right it's it's because of that coevolution right because of year millions of years of cycling through the human gut understanding what a healthy host's gut looks like understanding what that environment looks like. It's built into their genome and into their capabilities. And we outsource that job to them. You know, a, a, a great story of this is, have I ever told about the, the camel dung story, Siobhan? 
I don't think so, but I can't wait to hear this one. <laughs> this is an important one, right? So one of the ways in which the, the spores, the bacillus spores are discovered as a very important uh, probiotic is um, just after World War II. So during World War II, when the German army were in North Africa, lots of the soldiers were getting sick from severe dysentery. And what they realized, what they noticed is that when, uh, when the locals in North Africa would get sick, what they would do is they would actually eat or chew on dried camel dung that's found on the ground, right? And it'd make them better. And, and so they, they took some of this back uh, and, uh, into Europe and they started studying what is in the camel dung that actually uh, cre creates a, um, a warding off effect against pathogens that are causing dysentery and so on. What they found was that there was Bacillus subtilis, one of the key strains in our probiotic, right? And mm -hmm. so they found that because camels are walking around, they're eating, you know, dirt and everything else, they've got spores living in them as well. They come out through defecation. And then these locals have, have figured out that if they eat this high concentration of spores, when they're sick, it basically wards off the infection. And wow. so they launched in 1952, the first spore-based probiotic, which was a single strain at that time for the treatment of dysentery. It was a prescription drug launched in Germany and France and is still on the market today, used to treat gut infections in parts of Europe, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. It's a product called Entrogermina. And so it's been on the market for 65, 70 years now. And, and it's a bacillus endospore, right? So it's so powerful. Now, the area that we pioneered, because we knew that these spores would fight off infection and so on and do so in such a dramatic and powerful way without harming anything else. What we wanted to figure out is, do the spores do anything else to fix other things that are broken with the gut? Our whole premise was around leaky gut because we know that leaky gut is an underlying driver of the vast majority of chronic health conditions. And sure enough, we, we, we were able to publish starting in 2017, studies and data showing that the spores, when they get in, they do seal up the lining of the gut and stop that leakiness in the gut, right? So they're, they're fighting off uh, dysfunctional bacteria. They actually increase the growth of beneficial bacteria, which is something that we've also shown in publications, right? They increase right. diversity, they increase keystone species. We also show that they seal up the lining of the gut, so they reduce leakiness in the gut. Those are some of the most fundamental things that need to occur in the vast majority of people's guts and, and, and become really important in the vast majority of conditions. Okay, a couple of questions and a couple of comments here. You know, you were talking about eating dirt and mm -hmm. it'd be easy for someone at home to go, well, you know, I don't know anybody who eats dirt, you know, and you think about the kids and just like, yeah. you know, but think about your carrots and your potatoes and your beets and all of that. I was scrubbing, 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 not too much, but a lot of the dirt off of my vegetables over the weekend when I was making right. my soup and all that. So, um, you know, I think of it as like being inoculated with, uh, probiotics when I, I hear you talk about that but what else is in there yada yada so I like to have clean veggies and uh, I like to have my mega sport the other thing is can you talk and so you talked about keystone this is where we think of mega spore and other good probiotics as the mayors or the neighborhood watch these mm -hmm. are analogies I've been you know heard from so many different speakers, Jason Harlack, you and all that, and how they will help the little old lady all across the road. Mm -hmm. And they will, you know, make sure that the broken down trucker car gets off to the side of the road so other traffic can go. So they are um, really moderating and supporting, like you were talking about in a very dramatic way with the C. diff, but they're also moderating other strains in general. Just to recap that. Yeah. When people start... And then we have to talk about the the new the new thing that's old. Um, when people start, how can they start? And is it okay to take the powder, dump it into what they're eating? And mm -hmm. also, when you're taking herbs or uh, antibiotics, um, protocol for taking your megaspore with that. But let's start mm -hmm. with if someone's just getting started. Yeah, we're talking we always... about megaspore and and bets. We're talking about spore probiotics. And by the way, they don't colonize like take you over. So that was a big myth that I had Kieran bust mm -hmm. for me, like one of the first times I ever met him, because I couldn't find where to buy Megaspore when I finally decided I wanted to get it. And then I was concerned about that because I saw like a 
blog post or Facebook something rather about it. This was years ago. And so he's cleared all that up. That doesn't happen. But um, so how do you get started? Yeah, so we we ask people to taper up normally, right? So the full dose is two caps per day, taking a, taken at the same time, uh, usually with food, with food is always better, um, which is again, different than your old conventional probiotics where they tell you to take it on an empty stomach. Um, taken with food makes a lot more sense and, and that's how we, we do it in all our clinical studies and so on. Um, now we recommend most people taper up the dose starting with as little as half a capsule, uh, every other day for the first week. And then you can go to uh, a full capsule every other day, then a full capsule every day. And then by the fourth week, you're at two capsules per day, right? Uh, when, you're, when you're at the less than full capsule, you just pull the capsule apart, mix about half of the powder in any kind of food or drink, you know, warm, uh, cold, it doesn't matter, and take it that way. Um, now, the reason why we ask people to taper up is because these will go after pathogenic organisms, uh, which in, in some cases, in about 10% of people, uh, when, the, when the spores go in and start you know, reducing the pathogenic organisms, you might get what they call a Herxheimer reaction, which is you'll get some bloating and cramping and, and loose stool and so on, which is indicative of a change that's happening in your gut microbiome. It's in general a positive thing. But it can be uncomfortable for people, right? So to minimize that, we have people taper up. Um, so that's the basic premise. Now, 90% of people can start with two caps a day and be fine. It's just hard for us to decide and figure out who would need the tapering and who wouldn't. So we just have everyone taper. So that's the easiest thing. Now, if you're taking an antimicrobial currently, you don't necessarily have to space the spores out from the antimicrobials. They, they will do fine in the presence of the antimicrobials. They'll just stay in the spore state a little bit longer until the antimicrobials are dissipated in the system. Or, you know, in some cases, they, they can be perfectly stable in some of these antimicrobials. Uh, if you want to space it, just a couple hours apart is fine. But if it's not as convenient to space it, you want to take them together, that's totally fine as well. And this is where people say, well, is do you take it continuously? And hey, Steve, good to see you. Um, have they considered a titration dose pack so we don't have to split and get the reaction? I think you've asked that here, yeah, before. That's an interesting question. Uh, Megaspore is available in Europe. I do think that we have the, um, if you email us, at, well, if you email customer service at Megaspore, they can help you out because it's yeah. not, they're, they're, they have a like an agent there. Yeah. Um, Kieran, when we say, is it okay for long-term use? It's just like eating potatoes and carrots and beets for mm -hmm. long-term use. You, you will be doing that. Like you will yeah. be eating food. So this is kind of that. By the way, none of this is medical advice. Please speak to your practitioner if you have serious conditions and medical questions. We're just giving you information so you can start that conversation. You can try some things with that big, fat, juicy 25% off. And you do need to use our link to go through there. So you get assigned to our community and then uh, have at it. But I will say that this is like, I'm not asking him again for this because I think that'd be crossing the line. So I actually <laughs> do have, <laughs> shocking but true, I actually do have an awareness that uh, yeah. like I can't ask for that forever. So, okay. I already pushed with the 15, you guys, the 15%. So um, let's see here. Uh, is What about for kids, Karen? How do we, how do we help the kids? Um, so my kids have been taking it since they were my son, since he was maybe three or four weeks old. Uh, my daughter a little bit, a little bit later, um, maybe about four or five months old. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely dose it with kids. We usually do um, about a half or a little less than a half a capsule before, you know, between kind of zero and six month period where you just take a little pinch of the powder. You can just put it in their mouth or you can, you know, uh, some nursing moms We'll put it on the nipple before latching on. Um, after six months, if you're moving the solid foods, you can add upwards of half a capsule to the food. And then from a year onwards, you know, one cap a day is, is a perfect dose for kids. My kids have been doing one cap a day for the last, you know, my daughter, nine years, my, my son, almost 12 years. And uh, from time to time, we do bump it up. So if there's RSV or, or other things going around school, you know, which happens a few times a year, 
you've got you've got rotavirus all of a sudden migrating around and all the classmates are getting sick we we bump up the dose and we have them take two caps a day during those periods or when we travel they go overseas and stuff quite a bit so when we travel they we do bump up their dose so kids can absolutely take two caps a day but one cap a day is a perfectly fine um, maintenance for them and um, you know again you can open it up pull the capsule apart, mix the powder and almost anything. Um, my kids basically eat it in things like yogurt, applesauce, that kind of thing. Do not buy this on Amazon, Ute. They are not an authorized distributor. So please use our link to do that. And if you scroll up, you can find it. And these are only available um, through practitioners. And that's what's so cool about how Karen has helped us for my community and made it available for all of us um, without that, without having to go to the doctor per se. So please do not buy on Amazon. Nothing against Amazon. I'm, you know, the card carrying Amazon girl. However, for supplements as much as possible, I do steer away from that. And one of the reasons why is I met a woman who worked for customs and the, I think it was the FTC, Federal Trade Commission and all that. And she said that the amount of counterfeit that was going on there was staggering. And that actually eBay had um, pretty good because it was so bad in the past that they really cleaned their acts up. Sometimes, you know, going with a, like Southwest one day will probably be one of the best run airlines in the right. world because they just like had this major tragedy in terms of their tech. So sometimes. Sometimes when the pendulum swings one way, it swings positively the other way. I don't think Southwest yeah. is there and obviously God bless, but that's what I wanted to say. Please do order from the source as much as possible. We do have a full script account as well. You can order from, but do this with Megaspore um, and Microbiome Labs because it's such a big discount. Okay. I have to ask you this question about the new product, which is an mm -hmm. old, old situation. What's going on, Kieran? Uh, the metabolic health one? Uh, uh, yes. 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 Okay. So I want to say the word primal. What's it called? Oh, oh, the megagenesis, you mean. Megagenesis, megagenesis. Ah, okay, okay. So we'll we'll talk about that and then, then let's talk about the metabolic health study that okay. we as well. Yes, tell um, us about the study. Yeah, so so mega uh, megagenesis is a very interesting product. It, it it starts to speak to one of the very important tasks we think we need to do as part of a company in this community, in the, in, in the world community, really. Um, because one of the biggest dangers we are facing, and I, and I say this with no hyperbole at all, is the extinction, the mass extinction of critical microbes in our gut, right? So when we look at the hunter-gatherer tribes and all that still exists today, which kind of represents what our guts looked like a few hundred years ago, um, they tend to have around 400 active species. So in the high 300s, low 400 active species that live in their microbiome. The average uh, Westerner, especially in North America, we've done now 15,000 or so microbiome, full microbiome analysis on people in North America. We see around 125 as the average, right? So it's a huge difference. And remember what I was saying earlier, we don't have enough genetics to conduct a, even a fraction of all of the metabolic processes that we need to conduct. We outsource most of that to microbes, right? There's some estimates that say that microbes conduct over 90% of all of the metabolic functions that are important to be human. And these microbes, yes, some of them are in the environment, which we get like the spores that come in and do the work, but then lots of them are the ones sitting there in your gut. Right? There's a reason why you have upwards of 40 trillion microbes sitting in your system. And all of their genetic elements outnumber ours 150 to 1. For every one human gene you have, you have 150 bacterial genes that we utilize. So if we start losing these inhabitants, we start losing functionality. And this leads to disease. Right? There's a reason why more and more kids are being born with automatic automatic dysfunctions already these days, right? Because their systems are simply not adapted to exist in the current environment because we've lost such huge uh, com, um, quantities of critical microbes. And so when you look at our extinction of 300 plus microbes over the last few hundred years, if you look at the trajectory we're on, we're going to be some very, very sick people mm. over the next couple of generations 
you know? And, and, the, and the analogy I like to give, because it's hard for people to wrap their head around this, think of the microbiome as a critical organ, right? And we're losing components of this organ from generation to generation. Our behavior today matters because whether or not we harbor these organisms and diversify them to pass them on to the next generation is the determining factor of the succession of these uh, of this ecosystem. And so if I were to tell you that your choices today would mean that our next generation of kids would be born without a spleen, we'd all be freaking out, right? right. And then the generation after that would be born without a spleen and maybe just one kidney. We would be very worried about that. It's, it, the, it's exactly the same kind of problem, right? Losing components of the microbiome is like losing really important organs. And so I emphasize that in a very significant way to talk about what our plan is, right? So we, one of the partnerships that we have is with the research team that works a lot with some of the existing hunter-gatherer tribes, like the uh, tribes in Papua New Guinea or the Hadza tribe in Tanzania. They've been out there studying their microbiomes, doing all kinds of analysis to figure out what are some of the important keystone or other species that we no longer have in our mo modern microbiome that seems to be very prevalent and important in the hunter-gatherer microbiome, right? And so one of the strains we found was a particular type of ruteri um, that we call PBW1. And that seems to be very prevalent and at high levels in many of these uh, hunter-gatherer foraging tribes that exist. And it seems like this microbe plays an important role in immune function and of course, gut brain function as well in cognition. And so we, we've been able to isolate uh, and, and characterize that strain properly and now are putting it into a probiotic that can actually colonize the gut with the goal of this being first of many um, ancestral Ooh. microbes that we're bringing back into the modern population, right? That's awesome. Which is That's so awesome. important. We have to reestablish this ecosystem that we've lost over the last uh, you know century or so. It's like the forest. Um, do we taper up with this? Tell me the name of the new formulation. It's, that's called, it's called Megagenesis, uh, and it's a single strain. Uh, you don't have to taper up. You can start it every single day. Uh, it's it's ideal for people who are trying to strengthen their microbiome. We don't have it indicated yet for any one particular function, right? We're not saying, oh, if you're SIBO, take this, or if you're IBS, take this, or if you have skin conditions, take this for support. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that this is a key foundational part of reestablishing the ancestral components of the microbiome. So it's a key part of strengthening the biome in general. Right, So you would take it as part of your routine of strengthening the biome, just as you might start looking at increasing diversity of your diet, right? Getting more outdoor exposure right. in natural environments, reducing exposure to things like pesticides and herbicides that compromise your microbiome. This would be a component of that to strengthen the microbiome. So that's called megagenesis. It's super exciting because to me, it, it's, it's the first stone in a path that we're laying down to try to reestablish the important ancestral micro, microbiota, right? And if we don't do it, I mean, who's going to do it? Nobody else. Yeah, be doing that's it. a very good point. That's right? a very so, good point. Yeah, somebody uh, has to do it before it gets too late. Well, I appreciate you doing it. And so can we take it? Hey, Caroline, by the way, um, can we take it with uh, Megaspore? And then I have to get back to that question of if you're taking herbs, or antibiotics, what's the protocol for? Yeah, so this one's going to be a little bit more sensitive to antibiotics or, or antimicrobial herbs. So I would take it apart from it, two to three hours apart. Now, here's the other thing that's critical. What we found is this species, one of the key things it does is it dramatically increases the utilization of resistant starches and prebiotics, right? So wow. One of the things of the hunter-gatherer foraging tribes that we see is their diets tend to be very high in resistant starches, right? Because the most accessible foods for them are roots and tubers and things that they dig for, right? It takes much less work than chasing down a wild boar or a porcupine or something like that to capture it. So they hunt occasionally, but they forage and they, and, and they gather every single day. And so a lot of what they forage for and what a lot of what they gather comes in the form of having high levels of start resistant starches, prebiotics, fibers, and so on. Now, remember the human system itself can't 
digest these these carbohydrates, right? Um, and th that's why they're considered non-digestible carbohydrates. They move into the large bowel where microbes have the capability of breaking them down. So one of the things we know about this microbe is its ability to really increase their utilization of resistant starches and fibers and prebiotics, giving you more and more diversity of byproducts. Because the big benefit from resistant starches and fibers and all that is that keystone mi microbes in your gut metabolize them to produce things like short chain fatty acids like butyrate, propionate, acetate, uh, you know, urolithins, antioxidant compounds, all of these really important things. So as you start taking the megagenesis, as you start increasing that into your gut, also start increasing the intake of resistant starches. Right. So you can do potato starches, plantain. There's so many different options out Bananas, there. That right? kind of yeah. thing. Exactly. Yeah. You just Google resistant starch. This allows your body to utilize it better and it strengthens your overall microbiome and immune system. If you have SIBO, that would not be the first thing I do. I'm just going to tell you, like, you want to be very slow, get that microbiome, like, and that's SIBO reduced and get some stability there, like with your megaspore, like that is going to help you. And then I'm excited because Karen, a lot of people have a problem with resistant starch. So to be able to use something that can help so that the resistant starch doesn't take over and actually gets utilized is huge. Okay, what? let's say I've got a, an antibiotic uh, that I'm taking for UTI, respiratory, whatever. Yeah. What can we do to protect ourselves through taking uh, the formulations that you offer? And by the way, there are a lot of formulations on the site today. We've just been primarily talking about spore-based, but there are also, there's a wonderful stool test, a vaginal microbiome test there, and... Um, I know, Karen, you have a protocol for when we take antibiotics, which can save our lives, right? They're not evil. They can save our lives. So Yeah. You just have to protect your biome during it, right? Um, which is fine. Um, and so we, the protocol we utilize is uh, actually three probiotics. And, and then if you can, add in the prebiotic as well. So the three probiotics are Megaspore, which, which is what we've been talking about. Right. The spore flora, which is a couple of spores plus Saccharomyces boulardii. Okay. And then E258, which is one of the main strains in Megaspore, but by itself at a higher dose. Now, the reason that strain is by itself is among the five strains that are in Megaspore, that's the most powerful in terms of, of competing with problematic bacteria, right? So we want to get a higher amount of that particular species in your gut while you're under the course of antibiotics. So what we do is we do two, two, and two. So you do two Megaspore, two Restore Flora, two HU58. Uh, so one of the, you know, basically two, uh, three times a day, you're doing each one of them. So you could do Megaspore in the morning, Restore Flora in the afternoon, HU58 in the evening. It doesn't matter what order you go in, uh, whatever you, rem you remember to do. Again, take them each with food or some degree of food. And that tends to be our antibiotic protocol to help protect the gut. Now we do that typically for three to four times longer than you've done the course antibiotics. So it was a 10 day course, do this for 30 to 40 days. It was seven day course, three to four times longer than that. Now if you can add in the prebiotic at two to four grams a day of the prebiotic. That's gonna be really beneficial as well because it'll start feeding lots of those keystone species, which is really important. So Deb uh, and a couple of other people had that question. I hope you got that. And uh, let's see, Candida. How do you see it? Were any of your products working with Candida? Mm -hmm. I know, I know, you have a specific formulation um, for that. Yeah. File here. So the Megaspore itself will will help with Candida because again, it's about crowding out, competing with, and so on, right? right. But there's another product called Mega Myco Balance M Y C O. Um, I don't know. I wonder if I have. A I have it in my drawer behind me, so I'm not going to go run and get it. Okay. Um, it's called Mega Myco Balance. It uses two unique ingredients that are really, really good at, at you know, warding off and, and reducing the growth of candida in the gut. And so it's got uh, undisciplinic acid and B propolis. Um, you can use that with the Megaspore to help uh, with the microbiome, but it's really effective. Uh, and, and it seems to, to be a, a very, very popular one among our practitioners because 
practitioners are running into a lot of people with candida. You would use that particular product depending on your issue uh, and you know, talk to your practitioner about what the right dosing time is. But on average, it seems like people use that for about eight weeks, six to eight weeks to get the candida under control. And then once you've got it under control, you should be taking over the space that candida took out to uh, inhabited with good microbes. So it's harder for the candida to come back. Uh, now you will always have candida in your system. It's also part of your commensal flora. Right. Uh, there are upwards of you know, 200 different species of candida that can exist in humans. Um, so that's, it's not a problem that it's there. It's just when it's overgrown and not being kept in check by the microbes is when it becomes a problem, right? So this idea here between using the megaspore and the mega micro is just to get it back into a level where the microbes are keeping a check on it. And then um, there was a question about uh, for someone taking Mega Quin D, mm -hmm. which is Karen's special formulation of D3 and K27. Did I say that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, is there any interest in also taking Myomax? Tell us about that. Yeah, so it would depend on what level of K2 you're trying to achieve, right? So uh, Megaquin D, uh, Megaquin D3, the, the amount of K2 per capsule is 200 micrograms. I personally like to take about 360 and above. So what I like to do is I actually take one Megaquin D3, and I do take one Myomax in addition to that, because each Myomax, uh, I believe... If it's the the still the current dosing of my my myomax, which is two capsules a day, I believe each capsule has somewhere around uh, 160 micrograms. Uh, vitamin? Are you talking about vitamin D? It's 125 micrograms, 5,000. No, no, no. Sorry, and this is in myomax, the other product. Oh, oh, oh okay, uh, I don't have that. Yeah. One. Um, so so myomax gives you about 160 micrograms per capsule. Uh, this gives you 200, so that puts you at uh, 360, which is the dose I love for K2. That's we, We've done a couple of different studies at that dose. Um, and then it gives you 5,000 IUs of D. Now, I don't take two Megaquin D3 because I don't need 10,000 IUs of vitamin D. To me, that's that's a bit high. Um, so one, one capsule a day of Megaquin D3 is perfect. Um, it, and that one bottle will last you 60 days because there are 60 caps in there. And then if you want additional K2 on top of that, uh, you can use something like a Myomax, which just provides a K2 without any additional D3 to it. So what I do is one Megaquin D3, one Myomax per day is what I take. Okay. Um, is there calcium pyruvate? That's how I say that. In Megaquin D? No. There isn't. So the calcium pyruvate is in Myomax and it's at a very small amount. It's something like 50 milligrams per capsule. Um, it's, it's not really functional at that level. So studies on calcium pyruvate in order to really kick up the Krebs cycle, uh, you're, you're taking it in the hundreds of milligrams, if not in the grams itself. Um, so it's really not doing much. It's really the K2 that's in Myomax that's important. Uh, what is the, when would someone use Megaspore probiotics, right? Which And HU58. That's a great question, Andrea. I actually didn't realize that I had that question myself. So that's just one of those, that extra uh, strain. Yeah. So you would use that in the case, uh, in cases where you suspect you've got a high amount of dysfunctional bacteria or opportunistic organisms, right? Or people with SIBO with overgrowth issues. Um, that's what we use. That, that antibiotic protocol I described earlier is also the same protocol we use uh, for people with SIBO. Um, if, you're, if you're looking to not use an antimicrobial or you've done an antimicrobial and it's not quite enough and you, wanna, you don't want to continue on it, uh, we use that in the case of people that have overgrowth or uh, um, overgrown opportunistic organisms trying to get them under control. Right, because that's that's what these organisms do. That's what Saccharomyces does. That's what the spores do. They do a great job of bringing down the growth of dysfunctional microbes in the gut. Uh, regarding the discussion on vitamin K two seven, you always recommend having K one on board to saturate the liver so K two seven can do its function. Is that true? Do you always say that? You want to get at least the RDA levels of K one in, which is which is important. And now it's not that hard to achieve the RDA levels. Okay. Um, recommended daily allowance, if you're not familiar with what RDA is. Uh, it's about 90 micrograms. You can find that in a small bowl of spinach, for example, okay. right? So K1 is in leafy green vegetables. 
Um, now, if you, if you have small amounts of leafy green vegetables throughout the day, you probably get enough. Uh, if not, then the other option, if you're not sure if you're getting enough, then the other option instead of Myomax is the Megaquinone. Megaquinone has the RDA levels of K1 in it with the K2, right? So you can not take a Megaquin D3, which has the 5,000 IU of D3, plus okay. 200 micrograms of K2 per capsule, and then okay. add in one cap of the megaquinone, which will then give you an additional 160 micrograms of, of K2 without any additional D3, because there's no D3 in there, which is fine. 5,000 I use is plenty of D3, but it'll give you about 100 micrograms of K1 to saturate the K1 needs. And then it does give you a little bit of um, um, zinc and, uh, and magnesium as well to enhance some of the K2 function, because those are cofactors for vitamin K2. So a couple of questions we do are going to be wrapping up shortly. And when you guys, gals, people go to microbiome labs, there's a lot of information about each formulation there. So I, I feel like sometimes it's a disservice to just talk about like, go there and order, go there and look around and really read up on um, these different formulations. Cause a lot of your questions are going to be answered there. Um, a question is um, megaspore sourced from soil or made in a lab? No, it's actually sourced from healthy human volunteers like 15 years ago. The, oh, wow. uh, the strains okay. themselves, right? Because what we wanted was to get spores that were already natural inhabitants of the gut, right? And, and that's an important part because you will encounter spores in the environment that don't colonize or don't work in the gut very well. And so we want to make sure that these are spores that actually inhabit the gut and know how to inhabit the gut, know how to play within the gut, which is really important. So originally, they were isolated from healthy human volunteers. We're looking, the laboratory at Royal Holloway University of London, we're creating a catalog and a data bank of bacillus endospores that are human inhabitants. And so that's where they came from. And then we started screening all of the different strains they had to see which ones had the most profound impact on health and uh, the microbiome. And that's where they're isolated from. So then that's where the they were originally isolated, the mother cultures, if you will. You can think of it that way. I and like then that. since then, the mother cultures have been maintained in a fermentation facility where every time we want to produce more, we use that mother culture to inoculate a fermentation uh, a giant fermentation vat, and we grow the spores in there. And then we isolate them and, and spray dry them into a powder. And then that's how, that's how they come to the US, right? So it's not like we're going and isolating them every single time. Uh, we, we need product, we grow them through fermentation. So interesting, so interesting. Yes, there will be a replay, everyone. Please check your email. I'm going to see if I can pull off putting that link again. Again, Remember, we are not going to have the 25% off uh, for very long. It is super temporary. And maybe I'll ask them again at the end of the year. But this is, uh, this is like a now or never kind of situation. And here's an opportunity for you to try it and see what you think. No below 15, you do register as a patient there, uh, well, through our community, I should say, and then use no below 25 and stock up. So Carlene's also asking, if you are concerned you're not getting enough K1 through your diet, should you do the mega quinone and the mega quin D3 together? Exactly. Yeah, one cap mega quin D3, one cap mega quinone, then you have the optimal amount of K2, you have a great amount of D3, you have K1, you have a little bit of zinc, a little bit of magnesium to help the K2 function. You're in great shape there and take it with food. Um, you want to take K2 and D3 and all of these fat soluble vitamins with food because they absorb better when there's a little bit of fat in the diet. Um, it increases right. the bioavailability. I do want to make a quick mention of the metabolic health study that we, want, that we talked do. about because Please this do. is the time of year where people are very motivated to get back in shape in metabolic health. And when we talk about being in shape, we don't talk about, you know, having a six pack and, and being all oiled up and, and shaved body on Instagram. That's not our version of being in shape. We're talking about being metabolically healthy, right? Good blood sugar control, low levels of visceral fat mass. Subcutaneous fat is a fat that we have all throughout the body. You can have elevated levels of subcutaneous fat and be perfectly healthy. 
right? But having visceral fat mass, which is the fat around the organs in the midsection, that's the really unhealthy fat. That's the fat that gets that that actually produces a lot of the inflammatory responses. It acts as a as an endocrine organ. It disrupts the body in so many different ways. And having elevated levels of visceral fat mass is the fat that drives metabolic syndrome cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, all of this stuff, right? Uh, and, and in fact, dysfunction in the microbiome, certain type of dysfunction is associated with having elevated levels of visceral fat and being overweight, metabolically unhealthy, and so on. And a big, big feature of being metabolically unhealthy is that you don't digest food well, and you have lots of chronic inflammation, right? That's the foundation of disease, chronic disease. So we had this, this premise a number of years ago uh, where I wrote this, this paper. It was basically a white paper. It's not a published paper, but it's a white paper I wrote about something called metabolic reprogramming. And my thinking was if I switch the microbes around in the gut, I can change the person no matter what they eat, right? It doesn't matter if they're not eating a healthy diet, if they're not exercising, right. They'll still lose visceral fat. They'll improve blood sugar control. They'll reduce inflammation just by switching the microbes in the gut. And so that was a hypothesis because it became very clear that certain people always remain lean and metabolically healthy almost no matter what they ate because of the types of microbes they had in the gut. So we did a, we did a study which finally published at the end of last year. That's why we're talking about it now. It took a couple of years to do this. This was a 90-day study with overweight individuals. So their BMI is right around 30. They were overweight individuals. And well, basically what we said is you take the spores and a prebiotic. So basically the mega spore uh, that you find, and then this uh, mega pre, which now in the new label looks like this. If you do nice. the capsule format, right? There's a powder form as well. And you might recognize the old, yep, there you go. The there's old the old label. label. Yep. Yeah, this is the old label. This is what the new label looks like, but it's called mega pre. Cool. If, you, if we take those two together for 90 days, here's what we saw. Without any exercise, we were very specific that if they weren't exercising before, don't start anything. If they if they weren't on any diets before, don't start any diets. You know, we had, and this was randomized placebo control study. So nobody dieted, nobody exercised. The people who were on the Megaspore and Megapre, when we did DEXA scan, that's a dual x-ray scan for visceral fat, we saw almost a 38% reduction in visceral fat mass, right? What? Significant reduction in that 90 day period. And all kinds of metabolic health parameters improved like glucose control, um, you know, satiety, hormone function, all of this stuff. We did this RNA wow. blast and we saw massive epigenetic changes in their metabolic response to food that indicated that they were becoming leaner and more healthy, utilizing the food better, and having less inflammation. We were completely changing the metabolic profile of these individuals without them doing anything but taking the probiotic and prebiotic. Now, we would never encourage you to have bad habits and just take the supplements. You, of course not. If you add it to an improvement in diet, if you add it to a little bit of movement, you don't have to do much, right? We're just talking about fast walking 15, 20 minutes a day, two or three days. Yeah, two or three times a week. Doesn't take much, a little bit of movement. Um, yesterday, I was uh, wanted to get some activity. So I just, I have this vest that's weighted that's like 30 pounds. It adds 30 pounds. Oh, yeah. Just put it on and went up and down my stairs 15 to 20 times. Um, simple things like that, right? But then when you add the metabolic reprogrammers, the Megaspore and Megapre combination, it changes your metabolic response at the core. And the core is the microbiome. The microbiome dictates how your body responds to food and so and how your body responds metabolically. And so if you're making those improvements and those behaviors, you're choosing the better lifestyle and you add this, you will make a significant improvement in your metabolic health, which this time of year is always a good time to start thinking about that for making a change in 2023, right? There's probably a lot of people listening here who've been wanting to lose weight get a little bit more metabolically healthy, but it's yes. hard because the way we think about improving our metabolic health is going to the gym for an hour, two hours, four or five times a week, right? Eating these strict restricted diets all the time, cutting calories like crazy, no more carbs, all this stuff, right? Mm. Just make small incremental changes and you will see the absolute difference. 
add in the prebiotic and probiotic, start changing your diet incrementally, start adding a little bit of activity, you will absolutely see the changes. This was a, a really exciting study to publish because what we were showing people is you can become metabolically healthy, healthier, right. metabolically healthier without making too much of an effort. Because the microbiome is running the show for mm -hmm. your insulin levels as well. And also fatty liver, that's all going to be impacted. Heart disease is also impacted by these exact things that we're talking about. Which and your immune system. system. Yeah, and your immune system. Keep in oh, mind, when the pandemic came around, the people that fared the worst were the people who were metabolically unhealthy, right? And all, right, right. Yeah. And exactly. also did not have good D3 levels. How can, uh, Gloria's just wondering about how we can get a copy of that study. Uh, it is published. I'll send you, we'll send you through Siobhan the link. Okay. Uh, it's in the, it's in PubMed. Um, well, go so, to PubMed yeah. then, Gloria, because I'm going to be sending the email out probably before I get the link. So it's in there. Yeah. And it does have your name on it, Karen? It doesn't. No, this was all done by uh, Brian McFarlane. So if okay. you look up McFarlane, M-C-F-A-R-L-I-N, first letter B, okay. uh, Brian McFarlane, and then it, it's going to be a study on um, metabolic improvements, probiotic, prebiotic. If you search that, you'll find it. Very recently published. I think it was just published in um, November, December of last year. Okay. What is the customer service at Microbiome Labs? The email. The number? Yeah. The, the, do you have an email address for Microbiome Labs customer uh, service? Yes. Yeah. So one of the, you can actually email info at Microbiome Labs, and it will come to us as well. Okay. That's easy. Labs.com. Okay. Thank you, Karen. I will see you next month. Thank you so much. It's My always pleasure. great to see you. Thank you for that generous discount and the updates. And everyone, be sure to open up that email that I'm going to be sending you. I'll let you go, Karen. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, and when you get this email and you click to, to watch the replay, you're going to see all of the other videos that I've done with Karen, including the one on leaky gut and, oh my gosh, vitamin D goes down rabbit holes and it's great. So it's like a whole course. It's free um, for um, the sessions that I've done with Karen. They're probably now, I don't know, close to 20. So don't get overwhelmed. Just uh, pop around. We also have a YouTube channel, SIBO Space F S O S. Um, and we have him on there as well. So those are a couple of places. I have not put any attention onto my fate, my, uh, my uh what's it called youtube channel i'm going to be doing some of that this year so it's quite uh it's fine but it's not like something i've put a lot of time and energy into but it is a way to get like down and dirty tons of information for free and uh we have people watching that channel over a hundred thousand minutes a month it's like multiple hundreds of thousands of minutes a month. So that just made me realize like I'm really missing an opportunity to reach more people because that is my mission and my goal to help educate everybody about this. So look for that coming, I don't know, in the next three months. Thanks, Gabriella and Donna and Jana and Andrea and Karen and everyone who is here. We do have um, Karen scheduled for uh, once a month for the next couple of months. We do not have that $25% uh, 25 off coupon um, at all. Like literally, I was shocked. He said, yes, I'm very, very grateful. So please take advantage of it. I realize for those of you out of the country, it's of course frustrating because we don't uh, offer it there. It's not, I just can't do anything about that at this time. Um, but it's uh, great to know that these formulas do exist and there is a way to order in the UK. You can reach out to their customer service and they will get you that info. Beth, I'm sorry to get a chance to talk about Parkinson's. Um, if you, if you... You know, if you email me at info at SIBO SOS, I will try to get you an answer. I can't say that about everything, but I, I really, really wanted to get that out there for you, Beth, because I know it's so devastating. And do you know my friend? Oh, he's a Parkinson specialist and he's excellent. Greg Eckel. He is online. Uh, Greg Eckel. He's got dark hair. Uh, I think he's in a summit right now. Um, he talks a lot about Parkinson's and constipation, um, but and he's out of Park City, Utah. He is a naturopathic specialist in Parkinson's, so I would suggest that. Okay, I got to go, but thank you so much for being here. Go uh, watch the recording, and definitely when you get the email, if you're not on our email list, be sure to um, email us at info at SIBOSOS.com, and we'll get you on there, or go to SIBOSOS.com and, you know, 
get the cookbook or some one of the ebooks and that'll automatically get you in on the list. Um, can you do referrals to providers? Sharon, we have a speaker list um, that you can check out. And that's also um, in our Facebook group, which is SIBO SOS community on Facebook with like 26,000 people in there talking about SIBO nonstop. Also lots of posts in there about Megaspore. To answer your question, does it work for people with SIBO? It does work for a lot of people with SIBO. Would you do it once you were SIBO negative? Dr. C. Becker, world-renowned SIBO expert, does say if you're doing probiotics while you're doing SIBO treatment and while you're, you know, still SIBO positive and they're working for you, by all means, continue. If you're SIBO negative and it's going great and then you add a probiotic, she does not suggest that simply because she doesn't want to mess up what you guys have, what, what you've worked so hard for. So I would do it sooner rather than later. Okay, Carlene, good to see you. Sylvia, thanks, guys. Thanks, Catherine. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye.